are going to yes okay let me start so i'm going to introduce myself for those who don't know yet c junction i am Leah shortino and i am the director and founder of c junction and c junction is the place you see is a public venue focusing on southeast asia so we are interested in all the aspects of Southeast Asia. And today, uh, the main focus is on refugees, and particularly refugees, children, and youth. We have started this morning, actually, with, uh, as you can see, a lot of this painting. There were quite a lot of children and uh, young, a mix refugee and not refugee, and this is their art creation. And then we had some performance, and now for closing of the day, least but not last, so to say, is a panel discussion about the importance of education for refugee and how to make education inclusive of all the different groups, in this case, uh, refugee children. So we have different speakers uh, that I will introduce uh, gradually, but uh, Rebecca and Nina Shan will be the first to talk about Thailand. Yeah, so first we will talk about Thailand, and Tini will talk about Malaysia, and then Arian will talk about Indonesia, uh, both about the policy as well as practical example of school uh, run by refugees or uh, that accept uh, refugees, so both cases. So please, Rebecca, you start. Uh, 
um, even though most refugees um, have to stay here for a number of years, sometimes decades, um, waiting for this, this process. Um, and during that time, the UNHCR can offer very little uh, protection. Um, so most of the support um, comes from NGOs, civil society groups, religious organizations, um, Thai, uh, Thai citizens, um, expats, um, but mostly from the refugees themselves. Um, although Thailand has never ratified the UN Convention for Refugees, it has ratified the Education for All policy, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goal 4 Education 2030 Agenda, and the UN Convention for Children's Rights. Um, and these all promote equal access to a minimum of 15 years of education for all children and young people, regardless of age, ability, uh, citizenship, legal status, nationality, and ethnicity. ethnicity. Um, so Thailand has made quite substantial progress towards meeting its education for all goals. Um, but one of the most disadvantaged groups of still uh, refugees and migrants. So for example, according to um, the most recent Thailand Migration Report in 2019, 164,000 migrant children are enrolled in school, while an estimated 200,000 are still out of school. So what are the barriers to education for all, for refugees? Um, there are economic restrictions and educational funding issues in Thailand which um, make it difficult to effectively implement the education for all policies. Um, there is quite a lot of corruption, bureaucracy and discrimination towards migrants and refugees in Thailand. Uh, so for example, one of the participants that I, I interviewed, um, she was 10 years old when I interviewed her and uh, she had been denied access to her local Thai primary school um, because they said that she was too high and she was given no other explanation, um, no further support to try and enroll and she was subsequently um, out of school for two years. Um, there's also a lack of information uh, about educational services and rights to education, um, both on the part of refugees themselves and also Thai society and um, educational, sorry, education administration. Um, there are economic costs to education, which many refugees find difficult to afford, such as uh, school uniforms, stationary books, transport, and food. There are significant language, age, and curriculum barriers um, which refugees experience uh, if they're trying to sort of integrate into Thai school. Um, this is especially the case for, for older um, refugees who have already attained quite a good level of education in their home countries and um, find it very difficult to start all over again with a new language, a new curriculum, um, a new qualification framework. Um, and there is actually very little alternative provision for this age group in Bangkok. Um, the Bangkok Refugee Centre, which is the UNHCR's educational arm, uh, does offer Thai and English language classes, but only for a minimum of six, six months to two years, maximum of six months to two years. And um, there's no sort of formal route to any recognized certification. Um, many refugees have experienced interrupted schooling or no schooling in their countries of origin, which can make it also difficult to adapt. Um, there are fears of registering children in school, um, especially if a, um, a family have lost their UNHCR status. And um, most, most significantly, there are fears of exposure to the public and authorities. Um, so because refugees are illegal here, um, they're constantly at risk of detention and um, arrest and heavy fines. Uh, so especially during times when there are a lot of police raids on refugee housing, um, refugees are just terrified of, of going out. Um, quite a lot of the participants talked of 
the mental health issues they experience as a result of this. And um, it just it means that they, you know, a lot of children and young people can sort of engage in, in learning and play, um, in recreational activities, cultural activities. And um, this has, you know, significant short and long-term effects on their, on their development and their well-being. So in terms of um, my research findings, um, many of the participants who had attended high school um, reported positive experiences um, with some uh, references to bullying and um, language and cultural barriers. Um, but I think it's important to kind of recognize and build upon these positive experiences um, because it's a good reflection of Thai society, um, even you know, despite the sort of the legal uh, barriers that refugees face here. Um, even though quite a few of the participants had graduated Thai primary school, um, only two were encouraged to progress from primary to secondary school. So there seems to be a gap here um, in terms of the implementation of education for all. Um, students who were unable to attend Thai school or unwilling um, attended formal, informal schools, uh, most set up by parents, community leaders, um, civil society groups and religious organizations. Um, these schools have minimal resources and funding and limited access to um, formally recognized certification. Um, some participants were unable to access any education and were experiencing severe isolation as a result of this. Um, some were fortunate to gain places in an international school through scholarships and sponsorship. Um, this is rare, but it does happen. And several of the young participants are currently in the immigration detention center indefinitely. One of the strongest themes to emerge um, from the research was this concept of community agency. Um, so refugees communities, refugee communities um, utilizing skills, sharing resources, and young people setting up peer learning and support networks. And some of these have actually led to formally recognized qualifications, such as the GED, which is the General Educational Diploma, um, a uh, North American high school equivalency test, and um, the IGCSEs, which is the British equivalent. Um, one example of this is Cedar Learning Center, which I'll let uh, Nirishan tell you more about. Um, so organizations like Cedar and Courageous Kitchen um, are heavily reliant on independent donor support and volunteer help. help. So if you or anyone that you know would like to get involved, um, then please get in touch. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, this is my email address if you would like to contact me for further information.
I am Niroshan from Sri Lanka, living in Thailand since 2011, under Fiji. I have worked many organizations in Thailand as an interpreter and translator. In, to the, uh, in July 2017, I got the opportunity to work with Altamira Worldwide, an uh, integrate and community liaison officer. Uh, so my job is like, I, I just want to meet the refugees and uh, I have knowledge then about the illegal uh, travel because you know, mostly the uh, Sri Lankans uh, they, took, uh, they went to Indonesia and they take the ship and go to Australia. So this is my part of the, uh, my job to explain how it is. So every week I, I did the workshop with the community events uh, for the refugees and I start to help uh, help them with some basic things. Yeah. But I feel something like uh, I'm missing something. Uh, really. So uh, when I go to the events, I just uh, I try to talk to the kids, uh, uh, the refugee kids, how they're living in the So I really understand uh, the situation that uh, they are uh, living in the home. Actually, like, they're watching cartoons and uh, they don't have enough time to talk to the parents also. Sometimes, you know, the parents fighting inside, so they have psychologically the like, problem. So I start, uh, I feel like I want to start uh, some, uh, something for them. So I reset the school that uh, really to give the children opportunity to explore their life back. Finally, I found J Square International School. Uh, that is school only for their charging, uh, transportation and also the books, uh, some other money to bring up and charging uh, like 3,500 baht for each student. So uh, I got 10 students, I sponsored them. Uh, but uh, I sponsored some children uh, that uh, Later, after three months, I just uh, 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 I just find out the education system is not uh, okay because uh, that school, like normally, they are not teaching. The kids go and play and they come, uh, come and also like the teachers very low. And they are like uh, one time uh, my kids got punishment. The teacher take the slipper and slap. Uh, so I just feel uh, it's not okay for the kids. Then I, me and my wife decide uh, we just talk each other uh, what we can do. So we rent the house. That's uh, just a very located street center. So we share the, the first floor to school and second floor to the school. Then, uh, yeah. So we name it like St. Monica Learning Center first time. Uh, and uh, also like basically after the elevator come to our learning center, we just feel that many of them thinking uh, like St. Monica is a Christian in Catholic name. So I'm going to give the more priority to Christian. That is not true. So uh, after I decide to I discuss with the Rebecca and Rebecca has to three women so before to change that. Because you know, like uh, I just want to tell you, like the Sri Lanka Center is not like a religion for this. It's only for the education for the kids. Uh, yeah. Uh, so when I start the learning center, I try to talk to the, all the NGOs. Uh, like before, I already worked with the Sanat Society, the DRC. So I went to talk to them, but uh, you know, uh, basically, like here, yeah, I just facing. As a refugee, uh, they will see the identity like as a refugee, so they put the second thing is skin color. Skin, uh, skin color means um, I really face many things uh, from the people who are I'm trying to talk about the school and help. So they rejected and uh, so many people actually they challenge me, I cannot run this learning center more than six months. Actually, I'm going to, we are going to celebrate uh, uh, second year soon, uh, coming back. We are going to celebrate. Uh, 
also at the moment like 11 students they are uh, get ready for the G. Gen they are going for the art language exam. And hopefully at the end of 2020 they will complete like 11 of them complete the GED exam. And I'm sure they will pass. My kids for me they are they are good study. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm, uh, yeah. And I'm, uh, yeah. My aim is like, I want to give them uh, free education for them. Some other things like uh, Rebecca already told me like, about the law and But here in Thailand, uh, I just feel uh, they're not like uh, an expert for me. If, uh, I don't know, maybe there's Thai people or not, but uh, wherever I meet the people, they think dark mean uh, bad people or okay. This is the good uh, I have more experience. Um, yeah. So many things uh, happen. That's why I like, you know, uh, I want to run this learning so that I want to give them. Even like, for me, like, I don't care, like, 100 or 200 people come, student come, I can give them uh, free admission and free everything. Because I, I know I like I, I can do it. Uh, thank you, sorry. <laughs> school, um, not including status and refugees. Um, 
and um, jumping back to our numbers, 60% um, of our children are Malaysian children who are marginalised, 40% of our children are refugee sailors and migrants. So uh, right now we have, we serve about 121 kids in the homeschooling programs between primary and secondary, we feed about 100 children a day. We shelter about 31 in our centre, we have another centre elsewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, and we sit on, try to sit on every single task force um, that's around. Very similar to what Rebecca's uh, presentation was, our kids cannot go to um, university, uh, we're not signatories to the Convention on the Rights of the Refugees, we have a reservation on the Convention on the Rights of the Refugees under Article 28, which is access to free and equal access to primary school education, so anything that we do is outside of that. Um, secondary school kids uh, who register in our homeschooling programs who are, who are refugees are non-Malaysian. Um, yes, we do provide so, sort of a secondary school framework, which is very much, um, um, I guess, copied, um, um, similar to the Ministry of Education of um, uh, syllabus in terms of the secondary school education and primary school education, but there are, of course, um, gaps. Um, we teach by subject. It's uh, not taught in competence. It's definitely not taught by age, and it's really based on competency. And what happens to them after that is up in the air. Um, some do get to scholarships to go to university, but then again, that's up in the air what happens to them after. Um, I don't know if you know this, um, but for refugees in Malaysia, um, the resettlement process can take 11 years. That was before. Now, because of what's happening with Trump and the whole uh, new policy, it can take 21 years. So we children are losing their entire educational school, uh, educational um, access to education in any way, shape, or form. And this just, we cannot tolerate this anymore. Um, so what are we doing about it in childcare? I am trained as a teacher. Um, I've never taught. Um, I've always been a non-profit. Um, but my passion outside of children is school and education. What do we do? Um, and child protection, what I've realized now, is only beneficial in certain intervention processes. A lot of the work that we do in Malaysia and a lot of places around the world is very much firefighting and a reactive um, approach to helping a child or protect a child. It's very, it's, it's, it's a lot of intervention um, applications that happen. It's not prevention, it's not solution based, it's not provision, it's all, it's all firefighting. And for us, what I've realized is that education is the key to child protection. It's the best form of child protection because it's about self-empowerment and it's about learning. And when children learn and when children find a way to apply what they've learned to better themselves and to be self-empowered and to learn life skills and some kind have some kind of educational pathway, then they will fend for themselves. And our job, I think, well my job, I think, as a someone who cares about child rights and what they do, is to try to create jobs for these for these kids. Refugees, um, and like many non-Malaysian children who are poor, are not allowed to work. The families are not allowed to work. So what are we going to do about this? I'm, for, I'm, I'm not exactly following that. Anyway, so what we've decided to do is we're going to create an employment, educational innovation hub in Chakit. We're talking about 1.5 uh, square miles the area. It's notoriously known for being one of urban poor areas in Malaysia. It's also got the most densely populated number of children and youth. We need to protect the children ourselves. It has to be self-sustaining, it has to be about child protection, and it has to be about jobs. And if the government won't allow um, the children and the youth and the refugees to get jobs, then we have to create them. And so we need to look and address the issue, looking at it from the outside, looking at it from a corporate angle, from a business angle. How do we do this? So what we've decided to do is we're using what's known as the um, collaborative, collective, uh, collaborative Collective Impact Model, which is basically a model that we've adopted from um, a model that's used and promoted by Stanford University in America. They've actually used that with uh, the Malaysian Collective Impact Initiative, which is the 14 corporate bodies in Malaysia decided to align all the educational programs to try to address the social issue in Malaysia. So we're sort of using the same model to try
Australia to address the issue of child protection policy in Malaysia, and the outcome will be creating jobs. One of the things about childcare is because it's so transient, because it's you know um, it's a business area, the informal economy sector is very, 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 very alive, I guess, and very vibrant. So what we're deciding to do is to try to create jobs that would fit into this informal economic system and create jobs within the four walls. So we're looking at soft skills, we're looking at um, 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 either e-economy, we're talking about forming um, um, e-wallets so that because, you know, refugees and non-Malaysians can't have bank accounts. Uh, we're talking of talking to um, businesses that do e-delivery services. Uh, we're trying to set up a GigX um, platform that allows uh, children and youth to um, sort of come up with their skills and their CV, I guess, online so that we can try to see where they can fit in. Um, we're talking to a lot of businesses. Um, this is all that's happening next year. This is just the plan. Um, um, we're talking at um, getting sovereign funds to help us work this out because we have a huge problem of youth unemployability as well. We talk about wanting to include young people and children and youth in our economy, but then we exclude refugees, migrants, and stateless children. So the whole point is if we want, if we're going to sort of shift the perception or change the perception of how we look at non-Malaysians, then we have to show them, demonstrate that they are can be equal stakeholders. Um, so that's the sort of brand is to create this ecosystem um, to sort of create the jobs. I'm more than happy to talk about and to anyone else about the ideas. We've got McKinsey Malaysia working with us pro bono and helping us create the community chess so that funds go in so we can create these jobs and uh, that's how we can address education, that the whole system and the whole area becomes an educational innovation. one left. 
Um, Indonesia is actually a party to the uh, Children's Rights Convention, but the refugee children still don't enjoy the rights they should have under the convention, which includes protection, shelter, um, education, um, and other services. And in the absence of government assistance, um, non-governmental agencies provide uh, services uh, such as uh, shelters for the unaccompanied minors, some limited um, legal assistance, and limited uh, medical assistance as well. Refugees in Indonesia also have very limited access to education. Um, different agencies and rights groups are trying to fight for children's right to attend school. And according to UNHCR, there are over 500 children, uh, refugee children now enrolled in uh, national schools. However, this also presents additional challenges. Um, there is language bar barrier uh, for the first one, and then uh, cultural differences, and also there is a lack of understanding about refugee situation from the side of the school, um, as well as the teachers. So actually, um, at Roshan where I work, there, there was a couple of children that were in national schools, but because of the problems that they're facing there, they quit and they prefer to be in the informal learning centers. And also, there is no formal mechanism to enroll, uh, which means that only a few refugee children are reported to be formally enrolled, while the rest of them are simply given a space to sit, but they will not be given formal certification when they complete the education. Uh, and meanwhile, the large majority of refugee children are still excluded entirely from the education system. So this is where the informal learning centers come in. And on this occasion, I would like to highlight some of the important work done by informal learning centers. Um, they are very active, and they have been playing a critical role in filling the gap created by the inaccessibility of educational services uh, for refugee children. Right now, there are on, uh, at least 10 informal learning centers in Jakarta and surrounding cities. Um, Roshan, where I work, was one of the first centers um, established in 2014. Uh, they follow different models. Some of them are completely refugee-led. Uh, some of them are um, more, more blended leadership. So like Roshan, it's a partnership between refugees, expats, and Indonesians, which allows for it to have a legal entity under Indonesian law. Um, it started very small. Uh, we had 30 students, but the number kept growing. And then we realized the scope um, of the need for education in refugee population in Indonesia. Right now, Roshan serves over 200 refugees, uh, adults and children, from 10 different countries. Uh, for many of our students, um, Roshan was their first school. Uh, for ma many others, it was their first school again after being cut off from, um, uh, after years of being cut off from their education. And many of them have experienced trauma. Um, some of them live in a very high stress living environment, especially those who are unaccompanied minors. And also many of them experience alienation from the society. And we know that uh, these are, this affect children's growth, um, their development, and their capacity to learn. So these are the problems that we, we knew early on that we need, to, we need to tackle if we want them to succeed in learning. So to do that, uh, Roshan needs to ensure that the, the, the students feel safe um, in, in the school. So to do that, we need to make sure that there is a consistency. We need to create routine and bring structure back to, the, the, to their life. Um, we've seen uh, many positive improvements in our students um, after being in the school for several months. So I had a student, she came one and a half years ago, um, she just came up from the detention. And when she first came, she was very shy, she was very timid, and now um, she's improving a lot and she can speak three languages, um, her own language, Farsi, she can speak Bahasa Indonesia, she can speak English very well, and she could read stories to her younger friends. Um, and this is what we want to see in Roshan students. And to do that, providing the physical space and providing teachers is not enough. So we need to make sure that we are intentional about this. So we'll look at different models, uh, such as trauma-informed education, as well as um, safe and healing learning space. So safe and healing learning space is actually a toolkit uh, laid out by the International Rescue Committee, and we adhere to the general principles of it. 
the, the goal is basically to ensure a safe, caring, and predictable space for boys and girls in conflict setting, in crisis setting, or um, in a high stress living situation. Um, there are many important elements of, ch um, of safe and healing learning space. One of them is ensuring the space is child friendly. And the other is um, having teachers and trained in social emotional learning. So at Roshan, our teachers are trained and equipped in social and emotional learning. And what it does is that it explicitly teaches children um, uh, skills such as uh, self-awareness, uh, emotional regulation, um, relationship skills. And the way that it is done um, is very fun, it is very interactive, it is very hands-on, and my students always look forward to doing this activity. Uh, so I'm going to sh uh, show you a very short clip of my students doing um, social emotional learning activity. Um, 
We also have self-defense class, creative writing class, um, also a leadership team where the girls learn to lead um, their own group. While all of these efforts are very important, uh, and while all of stud uh, Roshan students love coming to Roshan to learn for their personal development, at the end of the day, they need the formal certification to continue their studies or for their future employment. So uh, one, um, we do two things for this. Uh, one of them is GED, as explained by Rebecca. It's a document that is equivalent to a high school diploma from the US. And we partner with the New Zealand Embassy to make this project happen. And we also have a number of students um, that have passed the GED exam. And also we have Elite Open School. And this is a um, distance learning from an accredited high, um, high school in the US. So we also have, we just started a class with this uh, Elite Open School. And when the students complete the program, they will get a high school diploma from the US. And after we have GED and Elite, we see that their motivation increases. Um, our six, um, the, the exam passing is like 100%. And um, their progress is also ahead of the time. And um, yeah, so. But unfortunately, again, this is also still very limited to a uh, very small number of refugees. And like, um, uh, like uh, Tini mentioned earlier, we also have a very high number of waiting lists that we, also, we now need to close our application. So we believe that the most sustainable solution is still for refugee children to be granted the right to attend local schools in Indonesia. And to achieve this, we believe that there are four steps that need to be taken. First, uh, the UNHCR documents should be uh, accepted for enrollment. Second, uh, the refugee children should be provided transcripts when they complete education. Third, uh, informal learning centers can help refugee children to, to, for a smooth transition. And lastly, the receiving schools and teachers are provided ongoing training to learn how to best serve their newly arrived refugee students. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation I learned a lot and I think there is a lot to ask and to comment. So I open the floor to those who want to ask or comment from your own experience. Okay, Jenny. Yeah, first of all, I just want to commend all of you for the work that you do. And um, if you haven't been told already, what you are doing is nothing short of heroism. Um, and I think it's, uh, I work in the Rohingya refugee camp with kids and with IDP and refugee kids in Burma, in Myanmar. And my question really, I guess, is for um, Roshan and uh, Chao Chao Tati, yeah. more so than the two of you, because I think you do policy, is what, if any, steps are you taking? Um, what, what, if any, steps are you taking to, to change the policy from, I'm thinking, two organizations, meaning the UNICEF Southeast Asian Regional Office, given the fact that the CRC was an instrument very much pushed by UNICEF. So what is the UNICEF Regional Office doing in Southeast Asia? Because this is a crisis across the region. And the second being the ASEAN Human Rights Commission for the failure to implement what the signatory states have signed on for with the CRC. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Vivian. I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. This, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I'm late. Um, yeah, it's very interesting to learn uh, about the, this topic. Uh, basically, this is uh, because I'm based in Jogja, we don't have really uh, what they call the refugee in Jogja, the uh, with the children. But I want to learn more actually about uh, what uh, you have done in Roshan, uh, Roshan Foundation. Um, uh, my question, uh, I have two questions. The first one is. Uh, 
did you also the, do the advocacy? Uh, I mean, in, in terms of the of the what you call uh, policy, government policy, because uh, uh, the last uh, sentence you mentioned about uh, that uh, Indonesia need to, let's say, to uh, what you call uh, the UN, yeah, convention. Uh, and then this uh, this is related uh, related a lot to the advocacy uh, movement. And then the second one, do you also uh, got like um, what you call uh, the financial support for from the government? I mean in Jakarta or or from mostly from the funding yeah. the agency or even from CSR like what you did in uh, in Malaysia. And uh, if I have another question is, uh, do you also connect with other? Um, uh, organization uh, this, uh, uh, outside Jakarta, like maybe if there there are some in Medan or in Surabaya or in other part of Indonesia, you also have a connection with them, and then uh, uh, maybe you also can share what kind of uh, relation, and maybe you maybe you happen to also collaborate uh, with them. That's uh, my question. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Okay, um, to answer your question, uh, with EPRO, the UNICEF EPRO office here in Bangkok, um, I think what they're trying to do is to, do, to fund um, um, research and the mapping, um, I guess the mapping of where refugees are um, in, in the region. In Malaysia, UNHCR um, is working closely with the Ministry of Women. Um, in terms of um, dispersing funds that were given by the Qatar Foundation, specifically for Rohingyas. So I think this year and next year it's on health. Um, the third and fourth year will be on education, and um, I don't know what the agency is. Um, but they are looking at ways to strengthen the informal education sector. At the same time, um, uh, uh, what is this? Um, UNHCR is also working uh, closely with the Ministry of Human Resource to provide the, to, uh, they're lobbying for the right to work for refugees, which will help the families and therefore also provide a sector for refugee children to get jobs. I don't know how long that it's going to take, it's actually in the manifesto. We have a new government, um, which is opposition, which is the first time in 60 years. Um, they've only been there for two years. They're trying to push um, the manifesto, which includes the rights of refugees and status. It's a lot harder than they think. Um, for me, I'm a little more cynical. Um, so ICHA and, um, and um, UNICEF, I'm, they can go ahead and work on policies at the same time. I have to try to work within what we have now because we don't know how long policies are going to take. Great if it happens, we'll still, you know, we'll still support it. But I have too many children to just wait on the side, you know, and not get them jobs and, and you know, and there's the loads of other issues. We have a thousand children in ATD and in detention. You know, I've been lobbying with the government for six years to get five children out, um, under the pilot project for alternative to detention. Five children under 10 years old for six years, nothing's happening. So while the policies happen, yay, good luck, I'm still going to try alternatives because it's important.
much. Uh, as we saw earlier, that the, the learning centers are still mostly in Jakarta and surrounding cities, so Bogor and Cisarua. And different uh, refugee groups in Medan um, and other cities actually have contacted us and say, like, please open uh, also learning centers in our city. But uh, as we know that these NGOs are very limited in resources, um, so it's been um, not possible to do. Um, Oh yeah, no, the government doesn't provide any support for us. Uh, UNICR also doesn't provide any support for us. So it's mostly in um, our funding comes from uh, individuals who are part of our network, and also we uh, that's for operations. But for projects like GED Elite, it is uh, provided by a different uh, like grant funding. So like for example, GED by New Zealand Embassy and Elite by Elite School. Most refugees that I know just 
they're not really kind of appropriate to their needs. You know, like most young people know that they, one, need to know English because they're going to have to, at one point, they, they can't stay in Thailand, so they're going to have to move, um, you know, and most of the countries that receive them are English-speaking countries. So they're very aware of this, this need um, to, to know English and also just to work towards qualifications. Like a lot of the young people that, that weren't, um, that weren't working towards some kind of certification um, just kind of express that they're a little bit demotivated and um, you know they didn't really feel like they were progressing towards something. Um, so even though they kind of appreciated the fact that they were able to get some kind of an education, they were also aware that it wasn't necessarily leading somewhere um, and that they were missing kind of access to something a little bit more meaningful. Um, so it, it's, it is strange, there just doesn't seem to be any formalized um, kind of like funding and, and framework for refugee education here, um, in Bangkok anyway. It's all very bitty and all very kind of imper you know, um, unsustainable and, and very short term. And, and part of it is uh, some of these schools, um, you know, informal schools, have actually been targeted by the police, by the immigration authorities. Um, some of the participants in my research uh, spoke about how their schools have been raided and their teachers have ha actually been arrested in front of them. Um, you know, which is all, all obviously very traumatic for them um, and very frightening. And it's um, it's just very challenging, you know, trying to get these these things kind of set up and and run. I mean, you know, I really kind of respect people like Nirishan because even running a center like Cedar Learning Center for almost two years is a, a huge achievement. Um, and you know, he's really had to kind of like scrape and beg and forth. Um, you know, just to, just to get this something, and it's the best that I've seen. I mean, I've visited quite a few different different learning centres around. Some of them, you know, take place in like the living rooms of, of you know refugees if, if they're lucky enough to have one. Um, and you know, whereas Cedar Learning Centre um, has a you know computer room, um, it's kind of working towards sort of um, being self-sustaining through kind of enterprise activities. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, I, I really want to kind of draw more attention to it, um, which is why I was so glad that Leah agreed to, to have it, uh, because, you know, I think if, if more attention, more, you know, funding um, and awareness um, is, is made of, of, you know, initiatives like CEDAR, um, it would just be so beneficial for, um, you know, for, for Bangkok and for the refugee community here. So, um, you know, I really, <laughs> you know, I really, big respect. <laughs> I want to add a little bit about, I think uh, we need to see also the situation is quite different. In a sense, Thailand, but the refugee issue was more simple for Myanmar coming to the border and then the solution was to put them in camps along the border. And much later, uh, there is now starting to be awareness and also the number of refugees, so-called urban refugees that live in the city from a variety of country is much more a recent uh, phenomenon. So you can see also Cedar Center is 2018 uh, the Indonesian one is 2014. So in terms of development, we are now starting to get public attention for urban refugees. Really a relatively new uh, phenomena for uh, Malaysia is a very large number of, uh, of refugees, mostly illegal, but much larger than the number of urban, uh, so-called urban refugees that live in the city like Bangkok has at the moment. So I think in due time you will see more development of support 
to mention this, but at the moment we are at a very initial stage. Thai people are involved. There are Thai people that put a lot of money to get uh, the refugee out of the detention center because you have to pay for them to be taken out. And these often are Thai, Thai people who, who do this, but they do it beyond beyond the sea, not necessarily in an organized uh, form. And initially it was a lot of religious organization, also because it was Christian persecution, but now it's more varied. There are many Muslim also persecuted, etc. So it's also starting to diversify and see more secular and even Muslim uh, groups. So it's, it's, it's changing quite a lot in the last few years, and I'm sure we will see uh, more development towards a school for refugees. So far, the focus has been school for migrant children, also because they're not. But now we're starting to talk about school for refugees. So Thailand is a little bit different. Uh, it's quite, each country is quite different, actually. But please. It's a, it was just a comment, perhaps. Thank you for sharing. Because we, you know, we know the policy shortfalls. Um, so many countries in ASEAN have not signed up to the convention. And so you have increasing number of refugees with children no access to school, formal education. So even the jobs that you're talking about, I mean, they won't have work permits, right? I mean, it'll all be in the informal economy. And so I guess what I'm interested in is how welcoming or hostile is the local environment where you are building these children's learning centers? You know, and are there any more? I mean, you mentioned about Indonesia not having many more. You just have in Jakarta. And I don't know in Malaysia if there's other children's learning centers like yours in other parts of the country. But I'm just curious about how hostile or how friendly is the local community to refugees and refugee children. I think mean, that's just... Oh, uh, hostile. <coughs> But that's why we put some, because we have Malaysian ch children who were very, very poor too. So we put them together with their fights. Um, so we, we try to find inclusive ways, approaches to get the children together, like aid or youth, aid or two children. We, you're both marginalized, both groups are marginalized. And we try to do activities together, things that, you know, in harmony together. Um, we do, they have to do, they have to do certain things together. Um, so we try to find ways in which they work together more. Um, we have contracts with individual kids in our centers. Um, and, and even with the youth who leave after 18. So we have a youth group between the ages of 18 to 27 who are mentors. And I have I just told them, I said to the one, stop fighting with the refugees. They're us, they're us. We need to work together and get this done. So yeah, we try. We still try. Um, so I, I can only really sort of speak for um, the, what the participants in my research um, shared, and obviously it's it's um, a kind of mixed. For, from what I observed and perceived, um, it's quite mixed the, the kind of reception. Um, in terms of so some of the uh, participants, um, especially one community. Um, and there, most of the, most of this community are Hmong, um, belong to like the Hmong ethnic group um, from Vietnam, um, and so some of them did actually speak of you know neighbours that, that helped them, um, you know gave them food if, if they needed it. Some of them who even um, warned them if the police was come were coming, um, even actually hid them, um, and. So you know, I, again, I think it's really important to kind of um, build on on those those experiences that are shared and, and to sort of make people aware that it's not all kind of you know bad and hostile. And um, I guess it's like anywhere where you know you get sort of mixed reception to refugees. I mean, from the U, you know, I'm from the UK, and I'm obviously you know there it's very mixed. Um, but you know, th there are kind of funding, not funding, but obviously Thailand's sort of a middle income country, so, you know, there is this sort of, well, why, why should we, you know, why should we sort of help them when we're still helping ourselves kind of thing, but, um, 
yeah, and, and for the school, um, you know, like I, I said, a lot of the a lot of the children did report positive experiences, um, like buddying schemes that have been set up by their teachers, um, you know, friends that they made, um, and and I can see it. I mean, there's some uh, Somali kids that live near me, and um, they all go to my local Thai school, and um, they all speak Thai, and I see them kind of walking home with their Thai friends, and you know, and it's really nice to see that that sort of level of, of integration. It is, it is happening here. Um, it's just such a strange situation when there's this conflict between the law and you know, kind of education policies that are actually helping refugees. Um, but then the fact is they're, they're never going to be legal here and they're never going to be kind of legally recognized and accept well, they might be, maybe, hopefully, in the future. Um, never say never, but, uh, but yeah, so that's that's my, you know, sort of perception um, through, through the uh, research. Actually, uh, for my experience, like when I start the learning center, uh, I try to uh, negotiate with the hotels, five star hotels in Thailand. So they provide the material, like recycled with, uh, things like benches and so on. What I did, I just uh, donate to the local people. So the local people, uh, you know, everyone, where the poor people come to college, they try to ask me what is this, what are you doing and everything. So I just told them, okay, we are refugees. But we are, uh, this is the situation. Then, uh, but now, like everyone keeps supporting me. Uh, like, the Example, uh, last year the immigration rate my school, and they work, um, like around 11 immigration uh, police we came. They want to get us. Actually, I just explained what I'm doing and what the things is going on. Also, the neighbors come to talk to the immigration. For me, like, uh, you know, um, the learning center area, I don't worry about the kids or something, uh, because the family people also take care of the neighbors, they're giving the full support. Uh, everyone knows that uh, this place for the refugees, and this is the thing. Before they thought, like, uh, refugee means we are illegal areas. Actually, like, when you Google it, like, there is a mention about, uh, uh, five people said, like, uh, illegal areas. So their mind, they think we are bad, and we are like did something bad in our country. That's why we are coming to Canada. So when we like communicate, when we like have the good uh, communication, with them, so they give their love to us. Um, so uh, in Indonesia, again, because the refugees are in different cities. Um, the situation can be very different. So in Medan, uh, one of the cities in a different island, the refugees are concentrated in one area in the city. So they're very visible and people always know like that's the refugee area. So the perception about refugees in that city is, uh, is, very, uh, is quite unfriendly. Um, but in Jakarta, um, Jakarta and surrounding cities, uh, the population is very high, maybe 10 to 15 million, if you include the surrounding cities. And the refugee population is 7,000. And they're spread um, in different areas, so it's not as visible as in other cities. Um, as far as uh, my experience with uh, what I heard from my students, they, they don't really experience any hostile uh, behavior from local people. Um, in Roshan, um, our learning center, uh, we really try to build relationship with the neighborhood council. So everyone knows us and um, you know, the refugee children always buy things in the shop and you know, Indonesians also have very uh, friendly behavior towards foreigners and they think that the children are very cute and we really also, we, wh whenever possible, we, um, we do some kind of um, collaboration with the neighborhood, for example, um, when, during the presidential election, our center w was um, like a voting station. So we try to proactively build this relationship with the neighborhood. Sorry, just, um, just one last thing also. I think um, a big source of sort of community comfort um, is our kind of religious institutions like mosques, um, 
churches, um, a, a lot of the participants in my research, um, you know, referred to those places as places where they felt safe and they felt welcome. Um, so that you know, it's important to recognise. I just want to say thank you to Leah um, for, for you know allowing this to happen and supporting it and um, you know it's, it's an amazing resource and it's really you know even though there aren't you know this place isn't exactly packed um, it was yeah I mean there were a lot of people since this morning because we had activity since this morning so now this last part of I think was but it is being videotaped and will be on Facebook so I think a lot more people will have the opportunity to view it so I am sure it is the message is getting out yeah yeah I mean even just with uh, you know a few people like yourselves we, we really appreciate um, you know your questions and you know your ideas and just being able to express you know what what we've been doing yeah and i think the most is really time for the work that you are doing anyway i think the children are from uh Sidar center because his name is similar to your center so i get confused but Sidar center they were here since this morning about painting as well as doing performance and i i can see that they are extremely uh, committed and also their English, if they, this is what they are studying, excellent, better than my Italian English. So thank you very much for, and again, a donation on your way out. And the next event will be on the 3rd of December about sustainability of civil society group. So please come back. Thank you very much.